Hey everyone, welcome back to Tech Adventure. We will continue our journey into the field of embedded and software development skills. And today, we're diving into one of the most important tools in system and software design, that is UML diagrams. If you've ever been part of a software project, you've likely heard about UML, but how exactly do these diagrams help in designing a system or software? In this video, we'll explore the fundamentals of UML diagrams, break down the different types, and show you how to use them effectively in your projects. If you missed our previous video, I strongly encourage you to check it out first. It's an essential part of our learning journey and will ensure you're fully up to speed and on the same page with the rest of the content. In our previous video, we explored the second step of the software development lifecycle, SDLC, the design phase, in detail. To truly master this phase, understanding UML diagrams is essential. In this video, we'll dive deep into UML diagrams, what they are, the different types, why they're crucial for effective system and software design, and when to use each diagram. We'll also cover the tools commonly used for creating UML diagrams and much more. By the end of this video, you'll have a clear understanding of how UML diagrams can elevate your software design skills. So, let's get started. Unified Modeling Language, UML, is a standardized visual language used to model the design and architecture of software systems. It provides a rich set of diagrams to visually represent the components, structure, behavior, and interactions of a system. UML is commonly used during the design phase of the Software Development Lifecycle, SDLC, to communicate system architecture and design decisions to stakeholders, developers, and other members of the project team. UML diagrams serve as a blueprint for both high-level and low-level detailed design. UML provides two main categories of diagrams. One, structural diagrams. These diagrams represent the static structure of the system, such as its classes, objects, components, and their relationships. Two, behavioral diagrams. These diagrams capture the dynamic behavior of the system, showing how the system operates over time through interactions between objects, activities, and processes. Unified Modeling Language, UML, consists of 14 different types of diagrams. However, in practice, around 50 to 60% of these diagrams are used more frequently, and these are often referred to as the key or core diagrams. In this video, we'll explore those core UML diagrams, discuss their purpose, and explain when to use each one during the software and system design process. We'll walk through these key diagrams one by one, just as they are used in real-world projects. As we progress from high-level design to low-level design, we'll introduce each relevant diagram at the appropriate stage. This approach will help you understand when and how to use each UML diagram effectively throughout the design process. 1. Use Case Diagram Use case diagrams are typically used in the early stages of system development to capture the functional requirements and interactions with the system. It provides a clear understanding of the system's functional scope and helps stakeholders visualize how the system will behave. They are useful for communicating with non-technical stakeholders as they focus on what the system should do rather than how it will do it. Use case diagrams can help elicit requirements from users and stakeholders by showing them how they will interact with the system. It helps define the scope of a system and clarifies which functionalities are inside or outside the system's boundary. Use case diagrams make it easier for project managers developers, and stakeholders to understand how the system will be used, improving communication among all parties. Since use case diagrams emphasize user interaction, they help ensure the system is designed with the user's needs in mind. Key Components of Use Case Diagrams 1. Actors, external entities like users and systems, interacting with the system. 2. 
use cases, functions, or goals the system performs. Three, system boundary, defines the system's scope. Four, relationships, include, one use case uses another, extend, one use case optionally extends another. Generalization, parent-child relationship between use cases or actors. Two, component diagram. Once the use case diagrams are ready and the system boundaries are clear, we can move on to designing the system architecture. This is where the component diagram comes into play. It illustrates how the system is broken down into modular components based on functionality and the specific tasks performed by each component, offering a detailed view of the system's internal structure. A component diagram shows the structural relationships between the components of a system. It represents how different parts of a system are organized and how they interact with each other. Components can be software modules, libraries, or subsystems, and are connected by interfaces or relationships. Key components of a component diagram. One, components, represented as rectangles with a component icon. These are modular parts of the system, such as services, databases, or classes. Two, interfaces, represented by circles, like lollipop notation, or half circle symbol, indicating what services a component provides or requires. Three, connectors, represent the dependencies or communication paths between components. Three, class and object diagrams. Once you've broken down the components, we'll dive into a more detailed design for each one. These components can then be represented using class diagrams, object diagrams, or other UML diagrams that best capture the details, depending on the specific functionality of each component. This detailed approach ensures that every aspect of the system is accurately modeled and well understood before moving forward. A class diagram represents the static structure of a system by showing its classes, attributes, methods, and the relationships between them. It's widely used in object-oriented software development to map out the architecture and relationships of the system's components. Key components of a class diagram. One, classes. Represented as rectangles divided into three sections. The top section shows the class name. The middle section lists the attributes, data members. The bottom section lists the methods, functions, or operations. You can also show the visibility of each member like public, private, and protected in the class diagram. Two, relationships, associations, show how classes are connected. Generalization or inheritance, shows a parent-child relationship where one class inherits the properties of another. Aggregation or composition, represents whole part relationships, dependencies, shows how changes in one class may affect another. Three, multiplicity, defines how many instances of one class can be associated with another. Class diagrams provide a clear overview of the system's data and functionality by showing the relationships between different classes. They are useful for defining the logical structure of the system by mapping out entities, their attributes, and the functions they will perform. By organizing the system into classes and relationships, class diagrams help identify reusable components and promote modularity. If you're enjoying the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. We value your input, so feel free to share your suggestions for topics you'd like to see covered in the comments section below. Object Diagrams Object diagrams help visualize the system state at a specific point in time by showing actual object instances and their data, not just the abstract class structure. They are often used as an instance level counterpart to class diagrams, providing real world examples of how objects are created and linked in the system. Four, state machine diagram. A state machine diagram also known as a state diagram or state chart, 
State machine diagram models the different states of an object in a system and the transitions between those states based on events. It is commonly used to represent the life cycle of an object, showing how it moves from one state to another due to various inputs or triggers. Key components of a state machine diagram. One, states. Represent the conditions or situations of an object at a certain point in time. States are drawn as rounded rectangles, example, new, active, closed, suspended. Two, transitions. Arrows connecting states, representing the movement from one state to another. Transitions are triggered by events or conditions, example, a button click, time elapsed. Three, events. An external or internal occurrence that causes a state transition, example, start, submit. Four, initial and final states. The initial state is the starting point of the object, depicted as a solid circle. The final state is the object's end condition, represented by a circle with a dot inside it. Five, guards and actions. Guards are conditions that must be true for a transition to occur. Actions are activities that take place during a state transition. When you need to model the life cycle of a complex object, showing how it behaves in different situations, state machine diagrams are ideal. For systems or objects that have multiple states or transitions, these diagrams help clarify the state changes. Five. Sequence Diagram Sequence Diagram models the interaction between objects in a system over time. It shows how objects communicate with each other through messages, typically in a time-ordered fashion, providing a visual representation of the flow of logic in a system. Objects or actors Represented by rectangles at the top of the diagram, these are the participants, objects, or users in the interaction. Lifelines, vertical dashed lines that extend downward from each object or actor, representing their existence over time. Messages, arrows between objects, representing the communication between them. There are different types of messages. One, synchronous messages require a response, solid line arrow. Two, asynchronous messages don't require an immediate response, dashed line arrow. Three, return messages, dashed arrows showing a response or return of control. Activation or execution bars. Vertical bars on the lifelines that represent the period an object is active, performing an action in response to a message. Combined fragments. Represent loops, conditionals, and parallel behavior in the system providing control structures for complex interactions. Sequence diagrams provide a detailed view of how objects interact in a step-by-step -step sequence, making it easy to visualize the flow of messages, requests, and responses. Sequence diagrams are useful for fleshing out the interactions in a use case by detailing the messages passed between actors and objects involved. Sequence diagrams are particularly effective for modeling real-time systems or event-driven processes where timing and sequence of events are critical. Six, activity diagram. An activity diagram visually represents the flow of activities or tasks within a system, process, or workflow. It is used to model the dynamic aspects of a system, showing the sequence of activities, decisions, and parallel processes. It is similar to a flowchart, but with more focus on actions and decisions, often used to depict business processes or the flow of control between different system components. Key components of an activity diagram. One, activities. Represent tasks or actions that are performed in the process. Two, control flows. Arrows that indicate the flow from one activity to the next. Three, Decision nodes, diamond-shaped symbols representing points where decisions are made. Four, initial node, represented by a filled black circle. This shows the starting point of the activity. 
5. Final node, represented by a circle with a dot inside, indicating the end of the process. 6. Swim lanes, vertical or horizontal partitions that divide the diagram based on responsibilities, showing which department, role, or object performs each task. 7. Forks and joins, represent parallel or concurrent activities. A fork splits one flow into multiple concurrent flows, and a join synchronizes them back into a single flow. We covered the main types of UML diagrams, from structural diagrams like class and component diagrams, to behavioral diagrams like use case and sequence diagrams, and how each serves a specific purpose in visualizing different aspects of your system. Understanding and using UML effectively can help you communicate your designs clearly, avoid misunderstandings, and bring your software projects to life with precision. If you found this video helpful, make sure to hit the like button and share it with others who might benefit. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update on our upcoming videos where we'll dive deeper into next step of SDLC that is implementation step. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.